Hi friends, I'm Shauna. Welcome to the channel and welcome into another day of Vlogmas. Today's video is really special because it really captures one of my interests <laughs> and we're going to be talking all about marketing and branding in today's video. I'll get to those elements in just a second, but the topic of today's video really surrounds this idea of falling off. There have been brands that have closed and people have said, you know, this brand has closed because they've fallen off. They're not with it. They're not innovative. Hint, hint, Becca. And then there's also some brands out there that are still around. They're still kicking it. But people have also applied those same labels to like Clinique or Estee Lauder. So today I'm going to be talking all about this concept of falling off. And I'm going to be really applying it to four key brands and talking about whether that's true or not. And with some of these brands, I'm going to be talking about why I think they might have closed or, you know, if they've actually fallen off, if that's the reason why they've closed down. My perspective or approach in today's video really surrounds marketing and branding. And I'm going to be introducing some key concepts in this video that I think will help you understand where I'm coming from. This is not so much like a general or vague opinion, like, oh, they're not innovative. I'm hoping to be more specific about that and actually apply some marketing concepts to these brands. So the four main brands I'm going to be talking about in today's video are Estee Lauder, Vesca, Becca, and Morphe. I first want to talk about Estee Lauder and people have accused Estee Lauder of not being relevant or keeping up with the times. And I think some of what I have to say about Estee Lauder could apply to other brands like Clinique or even Elizabeth Arden. I think that there's some brands in this category that have similar brand vibes and I think they're appealing to similar people. But I'm going to talk about Estee Lauder in specific. Now, people have said specifically about Estee Lauder and I would say Clinique as well, that these brands are falling off and they're not being innovative or that they're kind of outdated and that they're really not utilizing some popular or common marketing tactics like influencers, social media marketing, PR items, things like that. In some ways, I do think that these comments are true. For Estee Lauder, as an example, they do not have a comprehensive shade range for all of their base products or all of their complexion products, even if they have them for some. And in that respect, I think the claims that they're falling off or not keeping up with the times is totally accurate. However, I think that some of the claims that Estee Lauder is out of touch don't really hold up or don't really capture the entire picture. Just because Estee Lauder doesn't appeal to you or even the kinds of brands that you typically would find on Beauty YouTube, Beauty YouTube is ultimately a market segment and it's just a part of the market and not even the entire market doesn't actually mean that the brand is falling off. We're all going to talk more about this. And I first want to talk about market segmentation. And I think that Estee Lauder understands their market and their marketing segments really well. Now, market segmentation, according to Professor Barbara Kahn, um, is the process of dividing up a market into distinct subsets where any subset may conceivably be selected as a marketing target to be reached with a distinct marketing mix. Now you can set a market segment for almost any kind of identity point or habit. So we, we can think about factors like age, gender, purchasing habits. So like if somebody shops online versus in store, geography, price points. I mean, the sky is kind of endless. Did I say sky? The options are endless. I think that Estee Lauder's market segments are an older generation, probably like a boomer population. People who buy from brick and mortar stores instead of online. Um, I also think that they are trying to capture customer loyalty. You know, people who have been buying them for years or decades, people who aren't shopping around is what I'm trying to say. There's a, there's a kind of consumer who likes to try new things, who shops around, who's really interested in trendy products. I don't think that those people are who Essie Lauder is trying to capture. I think that they're also going for luxury prices and feels, um, people who have more money to spend. So like a middle to upper class clientele. I also think that they're good at retention and getting those repeat customers and like a lifelong customer, if you will, the people who find their staple and stick with it. 
I don't think that the makeup community on YouTube looks to Estee Lauder to be innovative or, you know, leaders in the field when it comes to, I guess, yeah, innovation, technology, newness, things like that, or even trends. And I think the reason for that is because their, their main customer base, they're not looking for those kinds of things from Estee Lauder. I think their main customer base are looking for those staple core products or even more of the same opposed to being the leaders of innovation. I don't think Estee Lauder has ever been that. And so I think trying to be that would be a little out of touch for the brand or a little out of place, I should say, for the brand. When you look at their releases, they tend to keep products around for years and are also slower on the release train. They don't tend to release a lot of products within a given year. And so because they're not releasing a lot of products, I think they're really focusing on those makeup staples. And that is what I think they do well. I think I've said it twice or three times already. They're really capturing the makeup staple kind of person and their releases and how long they keep things around, I think really speaks to that. They also don't discontinue a lot. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that Estee Lauder has absolutely no innovation or technology in their skincare as an example, because when you do look at their top 10 products on their website, there's only one makeup in the top 10. It's the number 10 spot and it's double wear. All the other nine products are skincare. And there's obviously technology of some kind in skincare. And I'm inclined to believe that if you're going to charge $140 for a serum, there has to be some good technology in there of some kind. And I think the people in the beauty community shop differently than people outside of it. I think if you're in the beauty community, you're much more on top of new releases. And I think you're more inclined to try new products because you love makeup and you just want to keep your hands on it. And I think if you're in the beauty community, you're looking to make up much less in a utilitarian way and more of in a fun way. Sure. There can be people who are more utilitarian than others in the beauty space. There's all kinds of people involved in it. When I think about people like my mom, as an example, or when I think about people like other family members, they are much more utilitarian and they do get joy out of makeup, but certainly not to the extent that I that I have because I'm much more involved and enmeshed in the beauty space. And I, I come to love makeup and applying it and that whole experience of it, which I think is reflective of many of you as well. I want to now turn to something called brand positioning. And the Branding Journal writes that brand positioning describes how a brand is different from its competitors and where or how it sits in customers' minds. A brand positioning strategy therefore involves creating brand associations in customers' minds to make them perceive the brand in a specific way. Scott Cook, co-founder of Intuit, famously said, a brand is no longer what we tell the customer it is, it's what the customer tells each other it is. So here's the thing, brands can create their own po- their own brand positioning and every good brand will have a positioning statement. But if it's not distinct enough, it will not hold that place in the customer's mind and we will not create the associations with the brand that the brand wants us to. So if I were to ask you, what do you associate with Estee Lauder when you hear their name? Like, what do you think of, what do you think about them and what makes them different from other brands in the market? A good brand positioning statement should communicate its target segment within the statement. And it will also have two other key factors, point of parity and point of difference. Point of parity is just, in essence, how it's similar to the market and point of difference is how uh, this brand is different from the market. Like, Who are they comparing themselves against? So I want to give you a couple of examples and we're going to go on a bit of a tangent here and I'm probably going to go into this a little bit more depth than I need to. And please just indulge me because I love talking about this. So we're just going to take a little bit of a, a second here and hopefully you'll find this interesting too. I want to compare Starbucks with Dunkin'. Now, Starbucks, their brand positioning focuses on quality coffee and customer experience. Now, there's some documents that have been circulating about Starbucks brand positioning, and it talks really clearly about who they're targeting, and I don't think it would be a surprise to anybody. They are targeting profession- professionals, middle and upper classes. You know, you're know, you you're paying more, so you're getting that premium p- price point, but you're also getting that premium experience because you get basically extreme customization or as much customization in your drink as you could probably get out there. 
Their cafes are a social meeting place. You know, they have great ambiance. And if you're going to meet somebody for coffee, I think unless you're going to go to a small chain in your neighborhood, a lot of people are going to pick Starbucks because it's a pleasant place to be, great atmosphere. When we think about Duncan, now Duncan has actually a really clear brand positioning statement. Uh, theirs is to make and serve the freshest, most delicious coffee and donuts quickly and courteously in a modern, well merchandised store. Duncan is way more about speed and affordability. They're targeting a customer base with much less disposable income. And Duncan more closely resembles fast food, whereas Star- Starbucks more resembles a restaurant. And so I think if you even look at the cafe or the not the cafes, the the restaurants, if you will, or the the stores when you walk in them. Um, Dunkin's tend to kind of have more of that fast food chain environment than Starbucks. Both of these coffee brands are targeting different market segments, and you would absolutely not get one confused for the other. I want to next quickly talk about two fast food brands that are going after a more similar market segment. That's McDonald's and Wendy's. And when you think about these brands, I mean, at least first I was like, hold on, these are really similar. Like what actually makes them different? Beyond, let's just say the food that they offer, which of course plays a role, but these brands have to then take their brand positioning and actually brand it and sell you on the brand. And there are differences that we can really clearly, or that are actually really clearly articulated by the brand. McDonald's has a greater focus on family. They have, you know, the Happy Meal, the Play Place, whereas Wendy's almost exclusively goes after an adult market. So if you're in the car with your kids, are you going to go to Wendy's or McDonald's? I think I'm actually thinking more people are going to be choosing McDonald's because family is really built into their brand positioning and also that gets that gets expressed in their restaurants and their branding and kind of the messaging that they use to sell their brand positioning. Wendy's is way more focused on quality and McDonald's on speed and price. Now when it comes to speed, if you're in basically the restaurant industry or you know coffee, speed matters. I worked at Starbucks for quite a long time and let me tell you speed matters. Like we are keeping time of like drive-through times and things like that. But I think that there are some brands more than others who are really trying to emphasize speed. And I also think with McDonald's, the price point matters a lot. Affordability matters just a little bit more than Wendy's. I'm mentioning these examples to, I'm hoping articulate something here. Estee Lauder's brand positioning is honestly weak and difficult to determine. I just don't think it stands up to today. Here's what their official statement is. They say they're passionate about serving women, so they'll be committed to developing high-quality products that perform while giving back. Estee Lauder is definitely in that higher-end or luxury price point. I think maybe their uh, skincare, a little bit more than their makeup, but they're definitely higher-end, and I think you can see that expressed in their packaging and not just their price point. I wouldn't associate performance with these items as well as giving back, and I think that is... Uh, a failure on their positioning statement overall. I don't think they've done a good job in the messaging that they've used to communicate that to people. And so while they in fact might be doing these things, the way that they communicate them isn't successful. I don't think it's unique enough to stand out in today's marketplace. So while I think they understand who they're targeting well, I don't think that their brand positioning is all that great. And I think that's where some of their branding is getting lost in translation. So in my opinion, it wouldn't make sense for this brand to start viral marketing to millennials. That's the most crowded market segment in cosmetics. And I think that it would isolate a lot of their customer base right now and who they're currently targeting. If Estee Lauder is actually targeting a boomer population, which is a market segment that will decline with age, I don't want to get morbid about it, but like, you know what I'm talking about? There will always be a 50 plus demographic, but the boomer population is of course special because of just how many of 
how many people are in this demographic. Now, if, if the brand is trying to pivot or amp up their marketing efforts to ensure that they stay current and kind of keep their place in the market, I think that they should more clearly market and attempt to attract the 50 plus demographic. I think Estee Lauder already has an association with this group or targeting an older clientele, but I don't think that their brand positioning is totally reflective of that. I think if they want to stay relevant, and when I'm talking about relevance here, I think I think older brands who have traditionally relied on the brick and mortar or like the beauty counter sales have to transition for today's marketplace simply because of this movement online and just changes in the market. My take, if they want to do this, they should become the brand for 50 plus women or like 45 or 40 plus women. Create a new brand positioning and articulate that really clearly. What if 75 to 80% of their ads featured women over 50? What if all of their products were geared towards the needs of this specific market? There are lots of studies out there that have been done that when people see themselves included in branding and like, you know, brand campaigns and models and things like that, they're more inclined to shop from that brand. If you just think about in the makeup market, what brands are actively trying to market to women who are over 45 or over 50? And in general, how many, how many advertising campaigns do you see featuring women who are 50 plus? I think this is absolutely an underserved market. And if you are of that age and you're watching my channel, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I think that if if Estee Lauder does some some market research to figure out what kind of marketing or branding would appeal to women who are 50 plus, then they can create or, or, you know, retarget their brand to give women what they want. And I think that this could be such a great opportunity for them if they already have some of this association, but they do it in a way that is clearer and more exciting to people in this market. Let's turn now to Vesca. And I think Vesca closing surprised a lot of people. I'm certainly disappointed because they were a really beautiful brand, but I want to look at their positioning here. Um, Vesca was absolutely targeting the millennial market and their official statement or their first, their official brand positioning is that they're building a community driven beauty brand centered around high quality products and thoughtful ingredients. Their, I, their Instagram, I think also captures a little bit of this as to their brand positioning as well. They say beauty essentials for an effortless sun-kissed glow. I think their overall brand positioning wasn't strong or different enough. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that a brand can't succeed in a market today or that it inherently means a brand will fail. No, I'm not suggesting that. But I think that if you have a stronger, more dominant presence, a really clear, articulated point of difference, then people are going to come to you. And I think that that would just help. Fesco is very inclusive with their bronzer range. And when we see inclusivity in shade ranges, it tends to stop and start with complexion products or base products. And I think that there's overall in the, just in the market overall, there's a lack of diversity or shade ranges when it comes to everything else, blushes, bronzers, highlighters, even brow products or makeup palettes or not makeup palettes, eyeshadow palettes. How many times do you see a brand coming out with one palette and all of the transition shades are for light to light medium skin and there aren't many deeper shades that can be used for uh, darker or richer skin tones. And I think that their shade range is something that their, their brand has spoken about being really proud of. And I think it's one of the more unique aspects of the brand that they didn't really highlight as much as I think that they could have. Yeah, they do have beautiful products and their Instagram was really aesthetic. And I'm, I'm truly not trying to be mean here. In today's market, when you're trying to target millennials, the point of difference really needs to be clear and strong, most particularly when you're not a celebrity brand. One thing I learned about the millennial population is, you know, as a generalization, that this generation is the most socially conscious. So appealing to a social conscious nature is wise and something that I think people, millennials, millennials would spend more money on if 
you're trying to, let's say you have one bronzer from one brand and one bronzer from another brand. And they, let's say they have the exact same shade range and one is $1 more, but is more socially conscious or community driven. I think a lot of millennials would pay that extra dollar. Well, I think that that helps a brand in their positioning. I don't think that alone is unique enough unless there is some really specific socially conscious element like Tom shoes, as an example, the buy one, give one was I think a unique place in the market at the time. And I say this because a lot of other brands do this. And so there needs to be a little bit more than just being socially conscious. I also think that the high quality products and thoughtful ingredient type of brand positioning as well is not unique either. And there's so many brands in like the clean beauty space that are doing this. So what is different about your clean beauty brand? I I think what was a lost opportunity here was really celebrating the diversity of their shade range because one thing that clean beauty does very badly, and I think they're some of the worst offenders of this, is shade range. To have a great shade range in clean beauty, I think is a great point of difference. And one that I think that Veska could have highlighted way more than they did. I also think that Veska was a little bit more glam than what you would typically find in clean beauty. Their eyeshadows were so glittery, beautiful, and I think really a testament to that glam nature, something that also doesn't happen a lot in clean beauty. I think that there were parts of Veska that could have been highlighted way more than they were to create a much clearer point of difference in their competitors. Their brand positioning could have yeah, okay, include community driven, you know, but clean beauty with a great shade range and a little bit glam. I think uh, those brand positionings would have been way more unique, just in my opinion. Let's now turn to Becca. And I think that Becca dealt with similar issues to Vesca as well. Like Estee Lauder, people often have mentioned that Becca wasn't innovative and lacked ingenuity. That's true, but I don't think that a brand absolutely needs that in order to be relevant, be purchasable, or stand up in the marketplace. I don't think it's a necessity for a brand to thrive is what I'm trying to say. I think more so than the innovation, I think Becca lacked a strong brand positioning. I think that theirs was weak as well. In my opinion, Becca was going after the millennial marketplace and while I don't think they needed innovation in their products, what they needed was a clear, more well-articulated brand positioning. Why would you purchase from Becca than let's say Bobby Brown or Stila or Too Faced? Why Becca? I don't think being cruelty-free is enough for a brand to rely on on its own in this marketplace. I think it's definitely something that would make a brand more unique and go after a really clear market segment, but I do think brands now need more than that. Now, according to Professor Barbara Kahn, when a consumer is going to be making a purchase and they're trying to figure out what to buy, she argues that consumers tend to kind of create three bundles of factors to consider. And then she says that consumers compare based on these bundles and will ultimately select one that appeals to them the most. Bundle number one are operations factors, things like price, delivery, service, and reliability. So as an example, if you're going to go purchase a pair of jeans, having a good delivery or return policy can be enough for somebody to shop at one brand versus the other product or design. So things like style, innovation, technology, kind of features of the product, how it looks, feels, might even include packaging. And the third one is customization. How well does this product fit who you are and your specific market needs? She also suggests a fair value line. So what she argues is that you need to offer superior value on one of these things and fair value on the others.
And so when we think about Becca overall, when we think about their operations, their product and design and their customization, I don't think Becca was offering above market in any of these. And by the way, when I'm talking about above market or like above market value or superior value, it's not all price. I just mean, or I guess what Barbara Kahn meant was being above or being a leader in one of these spaces, one of these bundles. I don't think Becca was offering superior value in any of these bundles. When it comes to something like customization and shade range, Becca offered 20 foundation shades and 12 concealers for a long time. People weren't associating customization with Becca. And some of their last eyeshadow palettes before they closed, they were just duds. If customers can't trust that you're going to deliver quality formula, that you'll just have basically a palette that works, all the shades just work, you're not even offering at market value. You're offering below market value. You're not offering fair, you're not offering fair, fair value and, and customers can't trust you. I think Becca's highlighters were, were innovative at one point, but stopped after a while when other brands are able to catch up. I don't think they were a leader in any category. And if you don't have a unique brand positioning either, I think that there is a struggle. And I think that that was Becca's struggle. They offered a lot of good products. Their lipsticks are some of my absolute favorite uh, out there, but lipsticks are a dime a dozen. I think that there are other brands that are in a similar place to Becca, one of them being Stila, and I think another one of them being Buxom. Buxom does have their lip glosses going for them, but they're also not offering new products. They're not offering, I don't think they're leaders in innovation. I don't think they're leaders in price point or you know operations factors. And I don't think they're leaders in customization. I think Buxom in particular lacks shade ranges for a lot of their products right now. Their bronzer only has two shades. After a while, you develop a track record of this and people stop assuming or stop considering you when they're looking for something like customization. And that's where I think this concept of the fair value line really applies. You need to be offering what the baseline in the market is. And when you can't do that with shade range, then you're you're not even meeting the market at the bare minimum. So why would you pick Buxom over anywhere else or Stila? I think for both of these brands, articulating a clear brand positioning, I don't think either of them have it. I don't think that they have a great point of parity. I don't think either of these brands have a great point of difference either. Buxom, maybe lip glosses, but that's not unique in 2022. It's just not. And Stila, why would we buy Stila from somewhere else? I don't think they have a clearly articulated brand positioning. And I think a a good brand positioning is unique. And I think an excellent brand positioning forces the other players in an industry to change and creates a new baseline for fair market value. Think about Fenty. When they release their complexion products, they basically force the hand of the entire industry to change their shade ranges in order to complete, in order to compete, sorry. That is a really great example of of offering above market value and customization. Starbucks did the exact same thing with customization um, with their with their drinks. And I think McDonald's did this as well with their speed and accuracy, and Amazon did this with shipping. Whether or not you like any of these things that I've just mentioned, or you know, brand feelings of the brand aside, these brands did force the hand of an industry. Let's talk about Morphe now because I have some things to say about the brand that I don't know if they're popular. In the beginning, even when Morphe was black labeling their palettes, I think they were delivering above market value when it comes to operations and in the product design category too. This might sound counterintuitive to the concept of black labeling in general, but when you think about the early days of Morphe, they had great prices and they had all kinds of palettes with different kinds of color stories. And they were leaders in the field of 
customization, offering a lot of things, appealing to their customers, and also in price point. They were leaders in two categories. And also when it comes to their makeup brushes, I think this is where they really got a lot of people initially because at the time, nowhere else in the industry could you find that type of selection of makeup brushes for that price. Brands like MAC certainly had the selection, but you were paying that premium price point. You couldn't even get any of this from the drugstore. And so Morphe really had a unique position and delivering above market value as well. I also think that they understood their market segment very clearly right off the bat. They're one of the first beauty brands to target beauty YouTube and really understand that population. Their marketing efforts on YouTube were unique at the time. I think they really personified and set some of the standards for marketing to millennials um, and the beauty enthusiasts. They were creating products for the millennial, for people who like to try new things, um, the person who buys online, the person who wants to try everything, and the people who want a good value. They had a really clear market segment and they advertised to them so effectively. And I think that they were really leaders at the time. And, you know, I'm not applauding Morphe necessarily or saying that what they did was good. I'm saying they understood what they were doing and they were effective at it. They launched in 2008, but they didn't really come to beauty YouTube until 2013 to 2015, somewhere around that time. They were all about affordability and killer makeup. So their official brand positioning uses the term killer makeup. And I think that's definitely intentional because they're not claiming quality but I think what they're claiming is more so uniqueness. You are getting kind of that makeup artist kind of feel, but, and the uniqueness often that you get with like makeup artists associated products, and eyeshadow palettes and brushes even, but at a much more affordable price point. And that was definitely unique in the early 2010s. You could not get a unique color story with great payoff from the drugstore at that time. You could get them in smaller palettes, but you couldn't get these 12 or 24 pant eyeshadow palettes like you were from Sephora. That wasn't all that common. And if they were, they weren't the best quality or even comparable quality to Sephora brands. Their biggest competitor would probably be ColourPop. But at the time, in the early 2010s, or mid 2010s when ColourPop was established, they were only doing super shocks at that time. They weren't doing palettes. And so I think ColourPop caught up with them eventually, but they were unique for a while. And even when ColourPop did catch up, I still think the, the Morphe brushes did help them stay unique and relevant in the marketplace for a long time. People have really come after Morphe for their marketing practices and their codes. And I think people have come after influencers even more. And I think that is rightly so. And the larger point I want to make here is that I don't think that this could have just been literally any brand. I think it had to have been a specific type of brand to market in the way that they did. I just want to imagine for a second that Estee Lauder tried these tactics a decade ago. You know, Estee Lauder starts sending out PR boxes. They're sending, you know, free products to influencers. They're giving them codes to use with their subscribers and giving them the exact same perks as Morphe did. I don't think that this would have worked in the same way, largely because of the price point, but also the the brand positioning of Estee Lauder. You see what I'm saying here? You know, that it's Morphe's brand positioning is what makes their marketing effective or what makes their marketing work. And so I think that the brand and the brand positioning matters a lot. And I, I, I think there are a few brands who could have done exactly what Morphe did and have seen the same success. You know, there's been talks about bankruptcy with, with Morphe in the, the past couple of months. And I think what helped them for a long time was rallying with influencers But eventually, I think as the industry turned, so has people's perceptions of influencers. And I think, you know, the allying they did with Jaclyn Hill and Jeffree Star 
has now come to bite them in the butt a little bit, as well as these like really big 35 pan palettes. I don't think that they're what people are going for anymore. They were unique for the time. And I think that their their novelty went a long way in, in getting people to support the brand. But I think now overall, the their position with influencers is hurting them. And I think these big palettes are hurting them. And yes, they've they've done smaller palettes and such now. What Morphe, I think should potentially focus on now is loyalty. So in a basic marketing funnel, there's four stages. There's awareness, there's consideration, then there's conversion, and then there's loyalty. I felt like a lot of their money was spent on awareness and as well as conversion. And I think that they were spending considerably less. Like I feel like 90, 80 or 90% of their marketing budget was spent on the top of the funnel. And there was very little spent at the bottom of the funnel with loyalty. And I think that's their problem now is loyalty. They never, I don't feel like they spent that, those marketing dollars on loyalty for a long time. And it was just on get the stuff in people's hands, get people to buy, not on getting people to keep buying it and on retention. That is what is hurting them today. They, I don't feel like they've done anything in keeping customer loyalty and retention. And that, in addition to the turn of the field with influencers, I think that I'm not saying that they're going to be defunct or necessarily that they will fail. But when you're a brand that is basically making it into the market because you're really at the top of your game with trends, you're going to be like, you can only ride that for so long, I think. And I don't know if it's too little too late with Morphe in terms of loyalty, because I think people now just like, they have an opinion of, of Morphe and the influencer situation really has hurt them. And I don't know if they can come back from that. We'll see, you know, uh, I'm not trying to count them out yet, but who knows? I think as I was mentioning earlier on with brands who've kind of forced the hand in the industry, uh, I think Morphe really did that with influencer marketing. And I think ColourPop has, you know, really jumped on that too, saw the success of Morphe and really got in there and got their hands dirty with that. And I think that ColourPop is way more, has been more successful as a brand because of Morphe laying the landscape for them and ColourPop being able to do similar things, but tweaking them. And I think a brand that's kind of taken these strategies and adopted them for the 2020s is, I hate to say it, but Merit. I'm not trying to say that Merit is Morphe or that Merit has done all the nasty things that Morphe has done with influencers, but I think they've taken some of the strategies of Morphe and even, you know, ColourPop kind of following in their footsteps and re-articulating it for 2020. I mean, Morphe has gotten influencers to sign over their content rights for free. And Merit has really, really relied on influencer marketing. Uh, them being a cleaner brand or less maybe influencer collabi focused. I mean, they're still relying on influencers, but they haven't done any collabs with influencers yet. Just because they don't have quite the same association with influencers as Morphe did doesn't mean that they haven't learned from them and really adopted their practices. That's my take anyways. Such a fun video for me, a really long one. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. I'm really eager to hear what you have to say. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Uh, I had fun. I hope you did too. And I hope to see you again around here soon. Bye.